Hey everyone, uh, Suman, another episode of the podcast, Turning Companies into Communities, and this one is pretty impromptu. I was, uh, you don't know this, but Bonin Bao is, is, our, is our guest today, and I was writing down people who I thought would be epic to have on the podcast, and then I just texted you, and I was like, hey, maybe, <laughs> what, what are you up to? And then we got on a call, and uh, a day and a half later, you're, you're here. But uh, a bit about kind of Bonin's background, uh, Epic, I would say, kind of market, marketing executive, kind of creative, um, and now applying that knowledge in, in a really cool way to um, kind of help underrepresented communities kind of have a voice um, through Black Group. But, uh, you know, accolades are, there's there's many of them, Forbes 40 under 40, uh, Fast Company's 100 most influential creatives, um, you know, really amazing career in, as an executive, at, as the chief digital officer at Pepsi, VP and Chief uh, Media and E-commerce Officer at Mondelez, um, but I think also just a cool guy. So we met, we met, I guess a, a year and a half, two years ago in New York, uh, when and was kind of super inspired um, by your creativity. And and we'll talk about how that kind of relates to community building. But super excited to have you have you on here. So so maybe quick introduction uh, on yourself. I mean, I think you uh, you know <laughs> you you uh, while I love Forbes. It was Fortune 40 under 40. Fortune, okay, sorry. Because <laughs> I was too old to make Forbes 30. No. Um, no, look, I think, uh, I, you know, I, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, thank all of you for for watching and listening. Um, you know, I, I feel like the community aspect is something that I've seen throughout my career, uh, not just be impactful to building brands, but impactful to how people live their lives, you know, I was lucky enough to have my father live until almost 95. And uh, the one thing I realized just in that alone, uh, unfortunately my mom passed before my dad and I, I moved my dad down to El Salvador um, where he ended up, you know, we moved into a hotel with um, a good friend of mine owns, but he built a community down there and just watching how that community kind of kept him youthful and inspired. And when you think about society and, you know, humanity, the way that we have thrived and grown uh, is through community. And in many respects, I think the family unit, we no longer have our grandparents living with us and the kids and the grandkids living with the grand, you know, we've, we've lost uh, a lot of sense of community as a broader society. Um, so I'm, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, it's not really a surprise that if you build community, you can have, you know, impact on business. But I think for me, the biggest piece of community is how do we continue to remember that it has the biggest impact on our lives and on society. Cool. So I got kind of three parts that I want to go through. One is right, uh, kind of about your life, um, which I actually we haven't we haven't chatted about, and how you got to kind of working in um, marketing, working in kind of creative. Um, and then kind of how that journey looked and how you thought about community building as it relates to the brands that you represented kind of second. And then third, um, what group black is up to. Um, and so, so first kind of wh where are you, where are you from? Actually? I'm not, I don't know. I'm born and raised in New York. My are friend. you? I've lived in every single <laughs> borough. Um, I was born on 17 East 17th street. Then, uh, my parents who were a photographer and, uh, and built a, a, a photography business. In fact, my dad, you know, we just, we did a chise about five years ago, 60 years worth of photographs, which was a half a million photographs. I wow. have a photo on my back of my mom, actually, that he shot. Um, and my dad, you know, he took photos of black women when nobody were taking photos of black women, no professionals. He did uh, Beverly Johnson, who was the first black woman on the cover of Vogue, her book. Um, he did jazz musicians, he shot street scenes, he did special effects work and created techniques that are utilized today when nobody was doing it. We were looking at these boom lights. I remember growing up, I grew up in a 4,000 square foot studio and my dad bu wow. built his own boom lights because boom lights weren't even a thing at that time. So it's interesting to see LED booms now. And we, we shot a doc of my dad and actually he look, we brought out all his old equipment and to see new equipment versus old equipment, like it's a just a different time but i mean even during that time being a black photographer was rare you know um they used to say look at his work and say there's no way you did this and i remember being a kid on the back of the bike and we would ride around new york and he would drop off his book to all the art directors and stuff like that and i, I remember how difficult that was but my parents separated moved up to harlem my mom became a single parent with two kids um we were on welfare for a little bit so and statistically i shouldn't really be here 
Um, but yeah, that was, but my mom really focused on making sure that education was tenant to, uh, my, my youth. Uh, and I got lucky during that time. The school system was much different. Every school system had talented and gifted. That's a rant I won't go on about how I think charter schools have destroyed our communities. Um, but she always fought for me to be in talented and gifted programs. Uh, science became science and math became a thing. I graduated high school from Staten Island, so I've literally lived in every borough. Uh, wow, I and, didn't know that. <laughs> uh, yep, I gradu- when I graduated college, I moved to Queens. Um, my pa- my dad moved to Brooklyn and the Bronx, and I moved with him uh, early years. But I went to college, and um, I well, I went to Staten Island Tech, which is like the equivalent of uh, Stuyvesant, but the Staten Island version. Uh, which is funny to say, but uh, I, so in college I was a physics and political science major and I thought I was going to go that into makes sense. engineering law. Science. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I thought engineering law, that was the, that was the thesis. Okay. But I fell in love with uh, political philosophy. Uh, I got into Columbia for a uh, PhD program and I thought I was going to teach. Uh, and so that summer, but during, sorry, during college, we started a web company and I was always into computers. I got lucky. My mom uh, my mom actually, when my parents separated, later on she ended up dating a black engineer at Apple who was one of the six people who created the 512K. And so I got no a 512K, shit. very young age. Anyway, I taught myself to program. Isn't it crazy how those small moments can actually have such like, a transform, lasting... Probably transform my life, honestly. Yeah. And uh, so we started our first company with my college roommate, very cliche, a web company in college. We did the first Jordash website, the Soccer Hall of Fame website. And anyway, graduate that summer... Wanted to make some money, started freelance programming, Proxycom, Razorfish, all the big guys. And I went to a, a party, and there was a vodka fountain in a shrimp boat. And I said, you know what? This is the industry for me. So <laughs> I decided not to go to, to do a doctorate. And instead, I ended up uh, as part of a company at that time, which was the largest PR agency privately held called Ruder Finn. I was the co-founder with another guy, Scott, of their digital practice, uh, RFI, and we grew that business to a, a global business, uh, very big business. And the great thing is Scott never wanted to travel, so I got to travel all around the world at a very young age, opening up offices in Asia, da-da-da. But at that time, it didn't matter how old you were because if you were at the beginning of the internet, you knew as much as anybody did, right? Yeah. Uh, left there because Scott didn't want to leave. I moved over to IPG. Um, where I built a digital practice there, as well as I ran their investment group. I left the agency world because I thought clients were too dumb to buy good work, so I became a dumb client. <laughs> and I was the first chief digital officer of PepsiCo uh, around the world, which was a phenomenal experience because, you know, when you're when you're a part of a brand of that magnitude and scale and impact, what people don't realize is the changes you make, you get to go see around the world. It's pretty, it's pretty special. Uh, and also the brands mean something to people. So you're also a shepherd of, of a community in and of itself. Uh, I left there, became CMO ultimately of what was Kraft Foods and became Mondelez International, um, largest snack food company in the world. And then I was living in China and I was watching WeChat grow and I said, I'm going to invest in messaging tech and I'm going to become rich. And I quit. And on that journey, I met a guy named Rich who also kind of changed my life. Um, Bing Capital actually asked me to be a part of of uh, what was Sundial. Uh, oh, yeah. I used to get paid. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And so I went in as chief growth officer for 12 months. Uh, we grew that business dramatically, and then we sold it to Unilever for a pretty nice number. And uh, North, you know, well, a big number. Yeah. And, um, and then two years ago, we started Group Black, and here I am sitting on the couch with you a day and yeah. a half after a phone call. <laughs> you know what's epic, though? I think, like, I'm, I was... Honestly, I was looking at your LinkedIn this morning. I was like, what are we going to talk about? And I think one of the most interesting things that people gravitate towards is like those moments before you get to like the chief digital officer or the VP. Because those are actually what I think bring in a lot of the creativity and kind of allow you to do good work, I think, as, as an executive. Um, and I don't, I don't know if this is true, but I think we when we met... Did you do the Red Bull ad where someone... No, I dropped the guy out of the sky, though. Yeah, so you but showed me... for a stride. It was okay, so stride can, you, can you just tell that, that story? Yeah, you know... People, what people don't realize sometimes about me is, I, I, you know, I know. First of all, I used to tell my team, "No is easy, yes is hard," and so <laughs> my goal is to always get to yes. It might not be the yes that is initially pitched or you want, but 
I want to figure out how I can get to yes. If I can figure out how I can get to yes, then I can actually evaluate whether it's something we should do or not. So when people tell me no, I'm like, oh, okay, we're getting the yes on this one. So um, <clears throat> like four years before I left Mondelez, uh, a person came up to me, a guy who I still do work with, actually, we just did a great piece with him, um, came up and said, Bonin, I was speaking at an event, <clears throat> said, I want to drop a guy out of the sky from 25,000 feet with no parachute on and no wingsuit. Will you do that? I said, yes, I will do that. <laughs> And so I, um, <clears throat> I went back to Mondelez and said, hey, here's what we're going to do. They said, no. <laughs> Bonin, <laughs> is, <laughs> Bonin is not going to do that. And so for four years, I maneuvered, and it became part, eventually the program became part of what I was calling media monetization, which is how do we make our media actually make us make money, and um, which is not just sell more product, but literally how do we get paid. Uh, so we have you know, the number one branded game, I think, in history where – we make money on it still to this day. It's cash positive. Um, <clears throat> before I left, it had 12 million users, which is big for any game. Forget about a branded yeah. Oreo game that people play for two minutes and 21 seconds. And this project we sold to Fox, but a guy jumped out of an airplane, no parachute, no wingsuit from 25,000 feet, traveling at terminal velocity, and landed in a 100 by 100 foot net, which, by the way, when you jump out of a plane, you can't even see. So the physics helped, I think. It actually came around. I mean, I guess it wasn't, you know, I, it wasn't me jumping. It wasn't me structuring the jump. But I think what it was was it took me for that was the very last thing I did, by the way. I was like, drop the mic after that. Let's go. Let's go. It doesn't get any better. But it took me four years to figure out how to get that thing through the organization um, mm -hmm. because I knew it was something that was going to be epic and transformational for the brand, and it was. Um, but, yeah, that was a, that was a, a, a very... A very exciting moment, and I have to admit, a very good way to leave. Yeah, well, I remember someone showed me the video, and they're like, that guy did that, and I went to talk to you, <laughs> and now here we are sitting, so it's all about relationships. But I guess one one comment you made, so I'm from North Carolina, and I and I uh, live near Atlanta, and the Coca-Cola Museum, or whatever it's called, is, is there. And when you go to the museum, there's like a ton of brands, right? And to your point, all of them actually resonate to like a specific community, so you might have like the Fanta. Flat, exactly or like some smaller thing that you've never heard of and you can try it at the museum so but then to me it's kind of like and community is a super broad word so you probably like came here and you're like what the heck are we going to talk about mm. but i think it's interesting because as a the way i think about it and mark levy who was the first guest here talks about he was at airbnb when they started employee experience he was the head of people employee experience there and he talks about different types of community and one is connection around your company and your customers and so for me, I'm like, that's what marketing is, right? So how do you that's think what about good marketing is exactly right? Because you're like, shit, I'm <laughs> a part of this thing, right? How do you think? Maybe like any examples of how you thought about that. I mean, you've worked with a shitload of brands, right? So yeah, I mean, I think that you know, it's it's really about finding the central points at which people care and want to gather around, mm. uh, and. Those are the things that if a brand can authentically be a part of it, like I look at what was done with Honeymade and, you know, we did the first. So basically we turned the word wholesome family into a different definition of wholesome. So um, it was same sex. It mm. was because the reality is that 50 percent of families don't look like what we would consider a traditional family. white picket fence and right. all this kind of stuff. And, and so it. it was single parents. It was interracial. And it was a it was a rallying cry for those that weren't being considered wholesome or called wholesome to kind of and look at the other side is we got a lot of backlash. And as a result of that backlash, so we got a bunch of hate stuff, um, tweets. And so we had two artists that took the negative tweets, rolled them out, rolled them up and built a sculpture that said love. And then they took all the positive tweets, which was 10 times more, and they surrounded it uh, with, with the That's positive amazing. tweets. And that piece that went out was the number one watched commercial for the week that it went out. And uh, while well, they say commercial, it wasn't really even. It was just a, a piece that we, a response piece that we did. But the community rallied around that, and Honeymade grew in a way that no other graham cracker has ever grown. I think it was like 21%. So I think that that's... Um, you know, it's those type of things. But I also think about, like, Sour Patch. So it's interesting. 
we always joke it went from candy to celebrity, but Sour Patch saw an opportunity, and it's a, it's a funny story because I was on an airplane. I always wanted to invest in emerging artists, and I was I was the largest sponsor of South by for ten years in a row. Um, I didn't know that either. That's yeah, I, so, what South by is so we built Fast Company Grill, we built CNN Grill. We I mean we so much there was no non endemic brand that was down there. It was all LinkedIn, Microsoft before you know. Um, it, for interactive and then we brought pepsi down and we kind of transformed that that town uh and then all the other brands kind of followed us in fact our first sponsorship was all three festivals film interactive and music and it was one hundred fifty thousand dollars. you won't even get like you know it's like a <laughs> <laughs> you can't you can't get, even get anything for 150 <laughs> grand down there now so you know it, it's it's interesting to to see you know how that grew from early investment. That's another piece of community. Like the, the reason why we went to South by was I had been going. So I, this will, if I go this year, I think it'll be my 25th year. Well, maybe I'll come with South yeah. by please come <laughs> uh, 25 or 24th, something like that. And um, I had seen, you know, South by kind of interactive grow. The very first interactive opening party was at a bar called lucky lounge, which, you couldn't even hold, yeah, I mean, there's no, anyway. The interactive used to use one tiny little section of the convention center because there wasn't enough people. Um, but I watched that community grow, and the one thing about that community was that I wanted to take Pepsi and I wanted to turn us into the, you know, really the edge, the leading edge of digital. And yeah. I knew that that was where digital companies were now going to break, you know, Twitter, Spotify, da 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 and if we wanted to play in that space, then we should be able to break new ideas and concepts into that community. And the thing that's very difficult about that community though is they're very cynical. So if you don't bring if you don't bring your A game, then you're gonna get destroyed, which meant that we now had to make sure that everything we did was as good as any digital company would do, but yet we're a consumer packaged goods company. And we had three things, do no harm, add value to the community, and always bring uh, cutting edge. The first year we did it, we did PepsiCo podcast playground, which is funny because, you know, we were definitely ahead of our time. We had these pods that you could go and podcast in and we put the biggest hit. Well, there were two big hits. The biggest one of the biggest hits was just outlets like nobody had outlets. So we had like a bar in the center where we were serving. You and know, people are coming beverage. there. Shit, I gotta people were just charging like that was the whole that was the whole deal. And then the other thing we did was PepsiCo Zeitgeist and, you know, Foursquare had just broke there the year before uh so we the the, per, the i remember when i went there early days my very first time there there's a company called pure volume and i met the founder and we kind of hung out we, we we've since connected but uh um we didn't know where to go we had no we because we didn't know what we weren't cool we didn't know what the parties <laughs> were we, none of that stuff right so there was no way to figure that out, right? Uh, so we built the PepsiCo Zeitgeist, and it was an app that basically just pulled all the tweets, all the check-ins, and one place where you could see That's what was epic. the most, right? And it became the number one used app across South By for that year. And so it really catapulted us into, um, but it was really to provide value for the community. And, you know, I, I love the South By community. I yeah. mean, they've done, you know, so much for me, and I've invested. We did the... 3D printed Oreos. I mean, we've done so much there, but um, 3D printed Oreos. <laughs> yeah, 3D printed Oreos. Where you could people people wait online for two and a half hours, where you could literally <laughs> choose. You could taste it printed an Oreo based on what was trending on Twitter, but you could choose a tweet and literally taste culture through an Oreo. People have never seen anything like it. They went cra they went crazy. It was like watching <laughs> Willy Wonka. People were going nuts two and a half hours to get a a a an Oreo, and I ran into somebody because I told the story at a, an event the other day and somebody came he was like i have my photos of me waiting two and a half hours and here's the oreo i got they, oh it was it was nuts man but it showed really what the future of distributed production was so we were taking what was happening a in 3d printing so nobody had done a food product yet and also edge computing and we were saying how can we disrupt pace and speed of bringing a product to life at the edge of where a consumer actually is. And the funny yeah. thing is I ended up investing in a company called BreadBot, which literally is automated bread machines that are that bake bread right in the in the supermarket. 
Um, so we were seeing that innovation come to life now. It's very fun to think back about a lot of the stuff that <coughs> that we pioneered, like all, digital shelf. So we brought, actually, more than that, we brought, we, we did, the one year we had um, these, uh, we basically had, you know, like in a train station, we had all these flip boards, like, you know, how they, the trains change. And we we uh, we had these cameras all around South by that were the first kind of first of all the ads would change based on who walked by it so it would judge whether you were a man a female a mustache da 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 and then we had these scribes it was a scribe pen that recorded into the pen but we had these books and we sent out two hundred scribes to go any event any uh, of the. Uh, uh, talks that they went to go see they would kind of scribe what it was they would kind of you know and there was all these different things to answer and we basically collected you know a a, a a viewpoint on what south by was that year and you could watch different data go by in real time it was pretty uh it was pretty epic you know you know it's funny you're you're like kind of lighting up tell, tell me well because what could the community and i mean going back to the community the community appreciated that we were there we did pep 10 which was the first corporate venture group we launched down there we did women's uh women's um inspiration network so we had all women founders which nobody had done yeah we brought brand innovators down there i mean we just did stuff that supported and grew that community and showed how grateful we were but also allowed us as a company and i think that that's the other piece is that the most important thing about community is what do you give to it but also how do you learn from it mm. and that's what's well, so the the cool thing is like I mean, no offense to this. I don't think of. I don't think anyone take offense. I don't think of CPG as C, CPG and like creative creativity and innovation. To me, and I used to work in consumer investing. Like they don't necessarily meet, right? Or they don't. And they, you might not think they meet, but you've brought a lot of that, which is which is being probably in a, in a boardroom where people weren't thinking of the same ideas and you being like hey let's go to south by as a cpg company right like <laughs> right no nobody was thinking now people do it now, yeah now it's like commonplace but no i mean like we we brought snoop down one year we we took over we helped launch the golden ticket with uh foursquare and we i mean that year we took over south by that was the second year you couldn't go anywhere we opened up a bodega we turned we literally if you went up and down sixth street you could even buy a coca-cola we turned all the <laughs> coke machines really? it was all us man no 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 we, we we don't play around the town was blue when we showed up you know and we had just launched pepsi max um but you know again and investing in that community did that did that pay dividends for the oh overall? yeah dude i mean forget it it paid dividends for we used to take a an entire team down by that time I, I had 22 different heads of digital across the company we all used to go down we would bring execs down but we would learn from it but also just the sheer volume of conversation that that community had positively about us we used to call it the davos of digital we you know we i mean dude, we used to do radio remotes i mean it was we we really really invest in that community and we got a lot of value from investing in that community but i'll share another thing so the reason why i kind of brought south by up is because for me and then we also did music. But for me, South By was always about emerging talent. And I feel like the most important thing is when you bet on emerging people who are like, a, the, one of the biggest projects I did was Dear Mr. President at Pepsi. And the person who was the biggest influencer we paid $5,000 for was an artist called Lady Gaga. So, you know, <laughs> like, and people were not were like, don't bet, this is MySpace. She, her are MySpace was on, on fire, dude. But you bet on emerging talent because not only the community that's around that emerging talent remembers that you bet on them, but that emerging talent, and they're going to help carry you with it. So I'm on this airplane, and I'm flying back, and I end up talking to this guy who's next to me. I come back from Australia. Um, and um, and uh, Josh Cocktail, and he's an artist. And I said, hey, man, what's the biggest thing that we can do to support emerging artists? At this time, I'm at Mondelez. And he said, housing. I said, explain. He said, look, it's so expensive now. You got your tour manager, your merch. He's like, if you're an emerging unsigned artist, like, it costs a lot of money to just, so you're all living in, like, one hotel room. He's like, if you provide housing. Really? So, you know, you see all these creator houses now, but we launched a thing called The Patch on Sour Patch Kids. And all it was was houses in L.A., Brooklyn and Austin. And if you were an emerging unsigned artist and you were going on tour, you could book the house. We had 
chain smokers. I mean, we, I, it, the list is crazy. And they probably love you. They, or they loved it. <laughs> if you look at the videos, the interviews, they're like, I got to wash my clothes. I got to have a home cooked meal. Like, and th- th- you, I can't tell you how many videos were recorded, music videos were recorded in the patch. And we turned the kid into like a neon sign and we had, pool, you know, it was like, yes. and, it, but it transformed that brand. That brand be- became a driver of culture in a way that because we invested in that community of them and all the artists told, I mean, we, could, we couldn't even, the, the house was booked all the time. Like, we couldn't even use it. We wanted to have like a leadership <laughs> meeting in one of the houses, it was all booked, you know? And so, again, I think, Part of the community, the biggest piece of community is, is what do you give to it, man? What do you, how yeah. do you invest in it? You know? And I think one of the challenges and the things that we talk about at Group Black is, you know, look, if I told you there was a consumer that had $1.7 trillion worth of spending, but brands index maybe 10 to 20%, you would go, where is this mythical consumer? Well, guess what? That's the African-American consumer right now. Now, the sad thing is how we invested in that community over the last 20 years at the same rate that we invest in others, that would actually be, be $17 trillion worth of spending yeah. power, which that affects GDP on a scale that we, we don't even realize. And productivity and... All the just... pieces. Wealth generation. Re, I mean, but also, if you wouldn't you rather have a community that has $17 trillion that you can... Now, the challenge we're going to continue to have is that everybody knows that it's a growth area. So mm-hmm. every brand, every marketer, everybody wants to find a way to unlock that market. Now, the good news is, is we know how to unlock markets. It's called building true infrastructure. It's called China. It's called India. It's called mm-hmm. Brazil. Like we literally, and I remember growing up reading, you know, I wasn't at that level quite yet, but later on I was. But growing up, reading Harvard Business Review and watching how we were building China, right? Now, so we know, and we built it to unlock that consumerism. So we know how to do that. I mean, look, they were the number one purchaser of luxury goods up until, you know, just the pandemic. We created that, you know, in, but truly in partnership with the challenge that the African American community in the U.S. has is that the question will be, are, are you going to extract value from the community or are mm. you going to invest in the community to unlock the value of that community? And that's what brands have to think about. So yeah. Who are you going to work with? Are you going to make sure that the suppliers of your products are people who come from that community? Are you going to make sure that the sellers of your products are stores that are owned by that community? Are you going to make sure that the leadership and the plants and the, you know, that's the, going to be the question. And if you do that, the partners that you partner with, are they from that community? If you do that, then just in the advertising is $380 million that is going to go, uh, um, you know, in, in that will be reinvested in that community and that community will grow. And as a result of that, your business will grow as well. And so that's, that's the piece that we have to remember that the question about community is not just how, how do you create it, but how do you invest in it? It's so interesting for even just for Marco, cause we work with like heads of people, heads, all these types of things. And like what I've realized, if you come in, we will do these events. If you come in, and you immediately are like, cool, now buy my stuff. No one's going to give a shit about what you do. But if you're like, hey, we're going to create space for you. We're going to give to you. By the way, the learning thing is is super interesting because then you're like, I could actually change my offering to better suit your needs. And I want to talk about Group Black in a second. But before that, uh, I mean, you you were a black executive at a multi-billion, like multi-global kind of brands. How did you personally think about and then you, you're from New York, right? You lived in every borough. You have a very different viewpoint. I knew this when I first met you, right? You're creative, but that means you're di- like different, which different is good, right? Like, how did that just like feel? And I'll, I'll leave it at that. You know, my journey, it's, um, I've also lived in China, Brazil, India, wow. UK. Um, you know, there's very few cities I haven't lived in, or, or sorry, I haven't been to. Um, And I mean, there's a lot of cities I haven't been to, but there's very few major (laughs) cities that you can name that I haven't been to. Um, But I've just seen a lot of different cultures. Like I've been to Papua New Guinea, which is, I used to do six continents a year, just to give you a a sense of, of uh, one year I almost did seven on my birthday. I should have, uh, I've never done seven in one year, but maybe I'll. It's not too late. It's never too late. Uh, Until it is. (laughs) is, Um, You know, it took my dad from, we traveled around the Yucatan. I took him from South Africa up to Egypt for 30 days. 
Um, I did a, I shot a documentary on Papua New Guinea. So, I mean, I've seen the world, man. And I feel very blessed. And I think that the one thing I, you know, the one gift I feel very grateful is actually, I blame Scott Schneider, who was the co-founder of the RFI, the company out of college, because he never wanted to travel. So I got the benefit of, of, of travel. And I think that seeing other cultures changes the way that the, your perspective on the world. Mm. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting. I, I look back and I won't say what publication it was, but it was like, it wasn't fortune because you mentioned that earlier, but it was a different <laughs> industry trade and it was like 40, you know, 40 under 40, but it was like, you know, 2005 or something like that. And I'm the only black executive on it. And it's interesting because I think back, I got very lucky. My mom, you know, she never wanted me to carry the burden of, of, of that. Uh, she always wanted me to carry the positive of it. And her point was always, you don't have to be, de- you're Bonin. You don't have to be defined by anything that you yeah. don't want to be defined by, right? That is just be Bonin. Um, and, uh, my dad always jokes because technically my first name is Brant, my middle name is Bonin and my last name is Bow. And he's always like, she wanted you to be, cause I, I go by be Bonin about to, technically. So she's like, he's like, you, she always just wanted you to be Bonin. Um, and, but I remember when I le- was leaving, um, uh, IPG, I was concerned that the only reason why I was being hired was because I was black um, at PepsiCo, which was not the truth, by the way. I, I, you know, I probably one of the best of what I do. No, I'm not yeah. trying to be cocky, but it sounds like based on all the series. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I why well, not maybe the best, but I'm good. I'm good at what I do. And um, uh, and I a person who was a dear friend of mine who I had worked with, who was. Uh, chief communications officer at a massive pharmaceutical company. I called them and I said, look, here's my, they said, he said, look, he said, I have been in the closet at work forever. And he said, mm-hmm. and then one day I went into the boardroom with a pink shirt underneath a white shirt and I ripped my white shirt off and I just told the board, Hey, I'm gay. And he said, I thought it was going to be the end of my career. He said, actually, it was more beneficial to me <laughs> than I even realized. He said, but my point is, is that, so what? Yeah. He said, there are people who are born rich. Mm-hmm. There are people who are born with more athletic talent than you. There are people who are born with all different types of advantages. And if this thing, which tends to be a disadvantage, is an advantage, cares dude okay. but he <laughs> said he said who cares go do, go right. do good go, job. He, but he said but he said but make no mistake about it no matter what color you are you wouldn't be getting the opportunity if you weren't good mm. so he said the reality is you're good dude and so but look there's 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 always times on the journey where you question like you would get, hey, I want you on the diversity committee. Why? I don't know anything about creating a diverse work environment. I just happen to be black. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, like it is not my expertise. There's probably people way more better for you to have. Or, or you're wondering, are they questioning whether I'm here because of that? So there's always this tension there. Um, you know, I'm at a point where I, I, I'm, it doesn't matter to me. But you can question whatever you want. But I remember when I first took over. Um, at Mondelez and we, we had 12 media agencies and we were doing a review to reduce them down to two and I go to India and one of our agency partners there I go with this guy Josep and Josep is this uh, beautiful Catalonian man and uh, I know that because I was always told that they were like <laughs> we don't need you in the meeting we, we, <laughs> we got Josep <laughs> <laughs> so the no we're a big spender in India Cadbury. We're oh big. yeah, we're Cadbury big. is pops off in India. We're big, dude, and or we. I am at that, I don't, I'm not there anymore. So, um, so he, I walk in, and the head of the agency walks right up to Josep and goes, "Bonin, it's so good to meet you." Wow. And Josep is like, "Actually, this is Bonin," and he looks, and he wasn't embarrassed. He couldn't believe it. 
Like it, there was no way in his mind that this, I was the dude, you know what I mean? So you face those subtleties or, or like mm. getting on airplanes, you know, yeah. people, they, there's no way they assume that, you know, you're in first. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm not in first. I'm in the other class. The one that you don't even know about, dude. Like <laughs> that's the one that I'm in. Like where they, they call me and go, Hey, we're going to hold the plane for you. I'm in that level. So FYI, just so you know that, but you know, it's just, there's, there's constant, you know, like I remember I used to, t I also taught at NYU. I taught at NYU for five years. I was an adjunct lecturer while, you know, uh, uh, in the evenings and I would come out full suit and tie, try to catch a taxi. I couldn't in New York. People ask me, why do you like Uber so much? I said, That's man, I, it's not even about Uber. <laughs> I like getting in a fucking car without him. <laughs> with, I, I, I just like removing discrimination for the, those moments where there's very few times in my life where I get treated lesser than, you know mm. what I mean? And and that these moments are the, the, the subtle things that people don't realize. So all that stuff exists, and it exists in corporate America, you yeah. know, as well. And I, I, I've even seen it on this journey where I have friends that I've known forever that when we started this business, they go, okay, we really, we're, we want to work with you, but we want to make sure it's not charity. Charity, you are... I, I've been out of the game longer than you've been in the game, dude. Like, what are you talking about? Charity. Like, do you know, you know, and so it's, it's all those things and you know, you see it, but the, the reality is, is that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, but you know, we're on such a mission right now. And I feel like what we forget is that, and why we could do this in any industry, right? We could try to go and transform any industry. And, and our, our mission at Group Black is to change the equitable ownership of media, media and investment. Why media as a beginning point? Because right now 0.2% of media is black owned, 0.4% is female, 0.5% is Hispanic. That means 99% of media is owned by people who don't look like the majority of people who are in the world. I'll never forget, I had, and, and by the way, media shapes how we see the world, man. I had a conversation with Rashma, who many of you know, Girls Who Code. At that time, mm. I was oh, working yeah. I was working on uh, Swedish Fish. And I was trying to find something with Swedish Fish. And I said, Rashma, what can I do? What can we do? She said, make movies about women that showcase them as mathematicians and scientists. And she said, when the Atari came out, they were the usage was 50-50, female men. All of a sudden, Hollywood got a, a control of gaming and turned gaming into a boy's thing and dolls <laughs> back into a female thing. And... Now you look at the discrepancy of women who are, and then we learned that gaming actually leads to STEM education. And now you look at the discrepancy between women and men in STEM, and you can track it all the way back to the characterizations that media created. Media literally shapes who we are. And so yeah. for us, it's- Or who we think we should be. Or who we think we should be, right? For us, it is the most important thing that we could do to provide- not caricatures, but inspiration, aspiration, actuality of black excellence, of all the multicultural excellence, all those things um, that are absent from the media landscape today. And so um, I think that that's kind of the mission, the bigger mission we're on. It's incredible. So, so you just describe what group black well, does, we, the mission, like what, <laughs> Like just tactically, what are what are you up to? Yeah, of course. So, Group Black, um, we're the largest black-owned media company, um, and we've been around almost two and a half, I guess, years. Um, we, when we started it, we looked at the media ecosystem, black-owned, and realized that it was abysmal, and there were very few, or there were very small, and so we wanted to create a model to invest in growing the ecosystem. And at first, we thought. Maybe it was about investment, but as we spent more time, we realized that it was there was an opportunity to provide even more than that. So technology, so that they, you know, we can trade programmatically and measurement and those pieces. There was an opportunity to provide um, uh, investment in content creation, so we can create more content to build scale distribution, which is the biggest piece, which is scale, and actually, I guess technically the biggest biggest piece is access so how do we make sure that we get in the rooms to get the opportunities for that investment uh and so we started off representing six now we represent over 350 um we have huge partnerships with folks like mbc with disney um with ziff davis with um yeah 
Yeah, so you right. have these big companies, and then you represent these these right. brands. Right. That so we represent the, we represent 350 black owned media companies, yes. and we provide an easy button so that you can buy and spend at scale across them. But we also have struck partnerships that are distribution partnerships, so that we can take mm -hmm. black owned media voices and put them into. Um, access and put them You're into access and general market and provide scale. So you can aggregate demand of like, hey, we want right. to access this right. amazing market, right. and then right. it's like, well, you might not know how or even why, maybe, right. and then you make that right. And, and then we then provide scale, you know, and uh, and even you now sense for that scale, what in a sense for that scale in terms of well, like, now our data cloud can technically reach ninety three percent of the U.S. population and um, seventy eight percent of African Americans in the U.S., which I think. I'm almost positive is the largest, but we also do it with a level of sophistication that we have 44 different data points or, or data levers that you can pull um, to uh, to reach that consumer or target that consumer based on, you know. Um, so we provide everything from, you know, zip code to, you know, contextual understanding of what their behavior is, you know, what kind of car do they buy. Yeah. Like, so we've really pre cr created a level of sophistication around buying this audience that has never existed before. I mean, that's super compelling, right? Like, what's the, sc the scale in terms of, like, dollar media dollars, if you if you can... I mean, we have a half a billion dollars in media commitments that's been publicly okay. shared, um, so that gives you a sense. But, uh, yeah, I mean, and I, I, I can't share revenue with you. <laughs> No, 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 that's but, that's but, but. Uh, amazing tying together kind of the mi it's interesting because like the mission is actually very much formed by your experiences, right? You're like, okay. It's like formed by my experiences. I think it's formed by there's three co founders. I think it's formed by all their experiences, mm. you know. Uh Rich. Uh I was the first black business that I've ever seen at that scale in my life. And I had I'm thirty six at this time, thirty seven, I think. I had been in a lot of boardrooms. Yeah. I had seen you know, I came off of you know, being top 25 at uh a top 10 i guess technically uh the large you know one of the largest companies in the world and so i felt like i had a lot of experience and i had never that, i'm this is part of a piece of representation like i felt like i had never in my life seen a black owned family owned business of that size and uh so i think it's formed by his and it's formed by travis who uh you know, Travis is CEO, and uh, he's a young guy, and he was probably one of the most successful black tech folks that I've met uh, in my life as well. So I think it's been formed by all of our experience, but I think it's been galvanized by an amazing team. I mean, we wouldn't be where we were if it wasn't for the people who work at Group Black and the fact that they care so much about the mission and work so hard to deliver what has been, I mean, two and a half times growth versus last year so yeah. you know it's incredible so you i mean that's what we care about as well like community at at work and i think we've we've done stuff with you all but right uh, but you, you threw our christmas party <laughs> yeah, exactly. which was so we had you know we had pods so we had the west coast miami and east coast yeah and mine was the best yeah well we'd love but, to love to do it again but any any anything you would share just kind of uh we could probably go on forever in terms of just yeah. like well, maybe I've got I've got an eleven o'clock. So. Well, that's perfect. Yes, yeah, <laughs> just you know, like what what do you think is in store for you? You've had such an incredible. I mean, I didn't know probably eighty percent of what you just told me. So this is just like cool for me to hear, right? right? But like, what you think about kind of what you're going to be up to for the next kind of five ten years? What you hope to kind of achieve? Well, I think this is my mission in life. You know, if we can accomplish this, I think we've accomplished a lot, uh, and I don't think it's just a U.S. thing. I think it's. All right, it's a global opportunity. Um, I, you know, I want to figure out some kids. It would be nice. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm focused on one other thing. Uh, so we have a fund called Lockstep, uh, which invests in minority founders that focus on four areas: criminal justice reform, which I'm big on, um, healthcare outcomes, um, financial literacy, and education reform, but I think one of the pieces that I, I am kind of hot on right now is how do we help to drive more capital into the hands of diverse fund owners so that we can actually get capital into diverse startup founders. And I'm watching my wife try to raise capital and I've never seen anything like it, man. And it's funny because I'm listening to, you know, the story of FTX. And you look at 
the discrepancy between what he was able to do with not even a PowerPoint. <laughs> and you look at somebody who's got a business that has made more money than is raised to date. And the skepticism that investors have just around point blank, you got to say around female founders, man. Yeah. And, you know, and I get it because if they don't look like you, then you don't understand. But the track records are so much greater, but yet we can't, we don't get out of our own way. Um, and so anyway, so that's, that's. I'll have to introduce you to my mm-hmm. friends who, my friend co-founded Black VC, right. which I don't know if you're familiar with, but no. she, she works at Lightspeed. It's a lot of folks. It's not just a VC fund, but it's a lot of folks at other funds and they, and she's Sydney's amazing well, yeah, she's please. a great investor she happens to be black but she, she right. well that's the thing is that's also by the way i just happen to be black yeah it's like it's not right. like that it's just right. like right no 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 but but, but there but she's all, i mean i think what you know you guys could, should connect but i'd love to i mean so you'll probably see some of that coming out from from some stuff that i do coming up so awesome well i'm gonna let you get to your 11 but this has been just awesome pleasure's all mine my friend yeah. all, mine. all right cheers bye <laughs>